seated. Do you want to open with prayer? Yeah. Sorry, we had some technical difficulties in the back with the recorder. Um, let's open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you as we gather together to uh, learn of your great gift of Christ who went to the cross, that he died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. That believing only that, that we have uh, the perfect gift that you've given us into your perfect heaven. That his righteousness is put forward towards us. And that we go forward and spread your gospel. And as we um, become more and more irrelevant of the facts in the world, that you're the only way. Uh, that we can only get into your perfect heaven through Jesus Christ. And through that, we gather together to learn of more and more of your gift. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do we have any birthdays this week? I know of one. It's Vic's birthday today. Happy birthday, Vic. Big smile on his face. Did we have any others? No. We'll sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Did we have any anniversaries? No. If you'd turn in your hymnals to page 255. We'll sing the f first and the fourth, one and four. Six forty six. We'll sing all four. Thank you. 
for announcements this morning. Um, Majestic Pines at 11 a.m., Manor House at 1, and then today right after church we're going to have an elders meeting. Um, try and get back on track to, once one, get a schedule going for speakers, and two, to um, start looking for a pastor again. So if you know of anybody, um, we'll try and put out applications again, see, see where we can go from there. Um, the other thing up here, um, I see August 12th, the Big Fork at 3 p.m., and then August 26th at Grand Village. I guess that's all I have for announcements. Oh, that, yeah, for their, um, that's today, and Ronnie, is that? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't. I don't see it. I don't remember the dates. I remember them saying it last week, but I don't remember the date to the time. Next Saturday. Yeah, we'll have to get a hold of them and find out for sure. Um, is there any other announcements? Can't think of anything else that we need to. Yeah. Um, Bob Oakley, James Carter, Bob Oakley passed away, and just prayer for the, the family. Prayer for the family. Okay. We'll go over um, prayers after, before the service. Um, if that's all, then I guess we'll finish the last number. Page, page one twenty nine. We'll sing all three.
Thank you guys. Thank Kim and Chris and all the singing, Blair, Karen. It is um, it's good to hear the music that we have. Um, you know, it's a lot different than from what I'm used to being out at camp. Talk about a joyful noise when you got 50 to 60 kids trying to keep in time and in and then it's fun because at the beginning of camp a lot of the kids don't know the songs so it's about this quiet and there's only about seven to eight of us a few counselors that are really make a noise but then when you get to the end of camp when nobody wants to go home we we about rock the roof off because of the noise so, and I shouldn't say noise, it's joyful noise because they're singing and laughing and dancing and, and it's a good time. Before we get started this morning, um, do we have any others that we need to put on the prayer list? Yes, yes, yes. Um, any others? All right. 12 to 4, August 4th at Morristown Hall, 12 to 4, okay, yes, yep, if you go just west of Deer River, 46 is just past the casino, take a right, and it's my, yeah, no, it's just by our place, Morristown Hall, oh, yeah, there's, they have the detour, but you can get to the Morristown Hall, the, where the road's out is be, way beyond. It's about, um, we're three quarters of a mile, it's about a little, little more than a half mile up Highway 46. So anyways, let's uh, go through prayers. Uh, this week also, in your prayers, keep in uh, memory of Pastor Tom, I know yesterday his eye was bothering him and he was having problems with that. And then Mike's mom, Karen. And then um, I see put my mom's on here. Uh, two weeks ago she went down to um, St. Mary's to the ear. She had some problems with her ear. It was draining this and that and she went back two weeks ago and she has a tumor on the inside of her ear, on the, on the eardrum on the inside. They said it's not cancerous. Um, she's opting not to have surgery. If she had to have surgery, they said then she'd have to go into chemo and through all that. And she'll be 93 in, uh, in uh, September. So she's like, no, I've gone this long, this far so long, so. They figure that she, the tumor's been growing for, I can't remember, is it like five or six years. That's why her hearing in the one ear, she's just about down to nothing without her hearing aids in the one ear. So anyways, yes, keep her. And then Jim and Gwen, we always faithful to keep them and the family in prayer. Um, Ronnie Hines, Tommy Andor, and then, um, this morning, um, uh, a young gal by the name of Fallon, uh, she's five years old. She had, was it her liver? Kidney, Kid, kidney removed. But she does have cancer. So please, um, we know God can heal all 
through him. Just um, keep your, her in your prayers that they're able to, um, to uh, take care of this young gal um, and help her through what she needs to and help the doctors find and cure her. I know I've heard some, sounds like some medical stuff that's coming out that they're on the verge, but you know, who knows how far that out. I know they're doing tests and trials on cancer drugs and all of that and other things. So maybe, and then of course, uh, Jim's uncle passing away, um, keep the him and them and their prayers. Yep. Tom Moore. Mm. Okay. I don't know if everybody heard that with Pete Stocky. <clears throat> Keep him in your prayers as they go to take care of that too in the pancreatic cancer. Um, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we come to you with the wishes of the family that you take care of those that we have mentioned, the medical problems that we see as, as this body, our body, starts to decay. Help us as we go forward, help the doctors to diagnose, and help the doctors to be able to um, work with whatever remedy they can. We know that you're the ultimate, the great physician, and that um, if it is your will, if you take these, some of these people home, that, that their pain and suffering will be forever done. That their glorious new body will be, as you say, glorious. And then there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more everyday um, worrying about healing. And as you take us through the rest of the week, <clears throat> please help us to grow in your word. And through today, please, Lord, give me the strength as we go through this, and give me the words that I may spread your love, that we all can learn more and more of what you've done for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So, this is a different setting for me, and, and I, I thank the, the, bo the board for letting me to speak. Um, it's a different venue for me. As you all know, I speak out at camp, and this year was great out at camp. Um, putting together and getting people to speak was a challenge, but we went through it just fine. Um, I'm not used to this type of <laughs> speaking. If you talk to the kids, they can't usually keep an eye on me because I'm moving, I keep them interacted, and a lot of time I'm throwing candy. So um, I didn't think it was quite appropriate here, but I know everybody could use a little. Uh, and um, as I was talking with Dorothy this morning and I was eating, I shouldn't be eating that sugar, but I got to have something to pep me up. And that's the best thing about it. Anyways, as we go on here, I prepared a lesson, and, and it comes from at camp. And I'm going to try to do this with, uh, with the computer from up here because um, it's hard to do it otherwise. But at camp, you know, there was a couple young gals there. As I shared last week, there was a couple young gals. One was professed in the senior camp. She, she says, I don't, I don't believe in God. God is just another entity that somebody made up. And I said to her, I said, well, why is the Bible full of them? I mean, that's what the whole book, well, a book, the book, the Bible is just a book that a bunch of people wrote. I said, you know that the Bible is written over, um, over 1,500 years, and there's not one contradiction with 55 different authors 55 different books with 25 different authors. And I said, there's no contradiction from one end to the other. Well, yes, there is. There's contradictions everywhere. And I said, no, um, if you see a contradiction in there, please show me. 
And she said, well, you keep saying that we're all sinners. And I said, yes, we are. I said, um, you know, we, we, we say that we're all sinners. And I said, it, you know, it's part of our gospel hand. I got to thinking about it afterwards. I it was like, you know, it's part of our gospel hand. The second finger is, I have sinned. And if you turn over to Romans, turn over to Romans 3.23, it says in there, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we try to explain that. We try to explain what a sinner is. When you're a child, you steal a cookie, and then you say, it wasn't me. You know, that's the interpretation that we tell the kids. It's like, have you ever took something that you were not supposed to, like a cookie, and then when mom and dad caught you, you went, whoa, it wasn't me. Well, right there, you've broken two of the commandments. But this young lady said, but I don't do that in that text. So we need to answer a question. Am I a sinner? The Bible said I am. We just read it. But I'm not a murderer. Let's look at the Ten Commandments and the law that was given to Moses. Turn over to Exodus. It's Exodus um, 20. Verse 7. Let's start out these commandments. You know, there's over 613 commandments. If you read a little further in Exodus, you go into, there's over 724. But if you were to sit down and read through the Bible, the commandments that God had given, there's over a thousand commandments. I have a hard time not breaking one or two, let alone over a thousand. I mean, there is, there's commandment of, um, for the Jewish people, the sacrifices, the different sacrifices for the different levels of sin. I don't practice that. You know, there, there's, as you read through, you find more and more the commandments that, that God had given to Moses. And it says over in Exodus 20, verse 7, it says, Thou shalt ta not take the Lord's, thy God's, no. shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The Lord's name in vain. Do we do that? I sure I know I do. When something happens and I'm quick to anger, the old man slips out of me. The words roll out of my mouth, being faster than my brain. As some would say, my filter's broke. You know, and, that, and that's how it comes to be, is when you're not feeding the, the new nature with the Bible or fellowshipping with fellow believers or or even taking that time every day to read or just to pray. You're not feeding that new nature. So that old language of the old man comes rolling out at any point in time. You know, there was points at camp that, you know, and I hate to say it, but there was people that, even kids, a word would roll out and you'd stop and look and they would go, oh, I'm sorry. But that's, that's the society that we are all in nowadays. Outside of a camp or a church or a gathering, those, the old man is present. But as we feed the new nature, the new man, that old man's presence is still there, but it's pushed back down. You know, even if I say those words, it doesn't even matter if I do a, use a different words in the same simile. I still have broken that intent. 
I have still took the Lord's name in vain. Even though I've used different words or substituted words, the intent is still there. So then we to move on down. Let's move down to um, Exodus uh, chapter 20, verse 9. And this has to do with the Sabbath. You know, and this is the law that God had given Moses and to the Israelites as they were traveling. And it says in chapter nine, or verse 9, it says, Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day, chapter 10, or in verse 10, it says, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And in it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, man nor thy ma maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy, thy stranger that is within thy gates. The Sabbath, you know, isn't as pronounced nowadays as it was back then or in the Jewish belief. Um, you know, the Sabbath is the holy day. You know, I'm guilty of this <clears throat> as much as anybody. And more so in the wintertime than in, in summer. And with my job, you know, um, I get called to work. Need to plow snow, or if we have a terrible storm, you know, to go out and, and clear them roads. But why? Yeah, it is public safety, and... Yes, it's public safety and, 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 and people need to travel, but why should we need to travel? You know, the world has come to the point where, what did I hear during one of the major storms that $4 trillion on the East Coast was lost because of a three-day storm. Traffic was backed up for three days. Four trillion dollars. What is it in that that we needed to do without? You know, um, as God says, the bird doesn't save it for tomorrow. He gains today what he needs and then worries about tomorrow, tomorrow. God provides all that. But then, I, then there's people that say, well, we, we need to get to church. But, but we are the church. You know, when two or more gather together, we become the church. So if you're at home and your spouse or your children are believers, you are the church there. Just because we come to this building and we fellowship together doesn't mean this is the church. Three weeks ago, we had the church at for four days, for four days, and then we had a break, and then we had three days. We had the church. The church was there. Wednesday night, when everybody gets together here, there's the church. When people get together at the coffee shop, when two or more believers, there is the church. I want you to turn over to John chapter 12. Sometimes computers are the menace of me. John chapter 12, uh, verse 26. It says, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So anytime you're gathered together as a church, you're his servant. And where you are, he is. And where he is, you are. So he's with us at all times. The fellowship comes 
And that's basically what we're doing as we learn here is fellowshipping. And when we can gather that knowledge, like I said earlier, to feed that good side, that new man, that new nature, that is fellowship, that is church. So that's, you know, I get to that point, and, and, and I'm very guilty of it too, missing on Sundays, and, and you know, okay, well, what about vacations, you know? Why is it important the day to have a snowstorm when, when somebody's life could be taken compared to a day, you know, I have to, I'm, I'm going over here for a week and I won't be able to make it Sunday. I'm not saying that that's wrong and that you're not having fellowship or church where you're at. It's just that this meeting, this building is the day. And it is the Sabbath day where we should not be uh, laboring. Now that I'm older, I understand my father more, which if anybody, my family were here, they would laugh at me, but it was Monday through Saturday, it was on the farm, it was full grind. We went, you know, from daylight to dark. We'd stop for meals in between, but Monday through Saturday was full bore especially during harvest or planting. We would go full, full throttle. Mom would come out during, during harvest or during planting. Mom would come out with a car with food and we'd stop for dinner. All the hands would stop and we'd eat. But as soon as that half hour was done, we were back to work. But this is the one thing that my dad did. And it's gone through, you know, I look back at it now and go, huh. On Sundays, all work stopped. That was the day that we took a rest. On Sundays, first thing was church. Then we'd go from church, we'd either go to a park or we'd go to a friend's or a family's place and we'd have a picnic. And I remember my dad and the men, they would sit off to the side after eating They'd sit in a circle off to the side and they'd be huddled around the radio listening to the twins. It was just relaxation. Everybody recharging their batteries, being able to put forth what they had. Nowadays it's more so, now that I've been a believer, I do it more so, and then it becomes a fellowship. You know, recharge your batteries, but also recharge God, to recharge my battery of Christ, that I may go into the week again ready to handle the week ahead. You know, we all come across non-believers during the week, and a non-believer, once they pull you out of the word, they drag you down, and your battery, your battery of Christ drags you down and it drains you and you struggle but as you go if, you, if you're like, uh, like I am I'll go home and on my way home I have about a 30 minute 40 minute drive home every night and I have a CDs and it's on the Bible it's um, Johnny Cash reading the Bible and I have all the New Testament and I listen to it all the way home you know, all the way in the mornings, I'm gathering my thoughts and putting things. But on my way home, those 30 minutes is me listening to the Bible and getting my thoughts back in, getting my thoughts out of the world. But then after the twins were done on the radio, getting back to my dad, we'd all gather up and we'd all head home where we'd relax and get ready for the week ahead. So that day... Even though my father didn't know Christ at that time, he always put that day off to the side. That day was for God and family. Those were the two most important things in his life, was God and his family. And that's what Christ is saying, or that's what God is saying when he said to him, you know, put me first, take that day. 
yes, people labor, they have to work, and it's understandable with the times there is today, you have to do that. But just make sure you take that time for yourself and God. So we move on a little more here. And it says, um, we move down to um, Exodus 20. I guess I was in 2012. I should have been there in 2012. Uh, Exodus 2013. Sorry. So when we get into the main meat and meat of it, where the thou shall not, and the first one now is thou shall not kill. I guess I'm back at 2012, sorry. But that is honor thy mother and father. And at Exodus 2012, honor thy mother and father. You know, we look back at where Christianity, and I hate to say where it failed, but basically where it failed is where the mother and father didn't honor the children. They didn't carry forth what Christ had done. Although the children didn't honor mother and father by saying, yes, what Christ has done on the cross is all that we need. They went off and said, well, no, that can't be that easy. We have to do more, you know more be baptized and they rebelled against their mother and father they didn't honor the true belief of what Christ had done they added more well it can't be that easy well it is no it can't I have to do my part well your part is is belief the only work that you put into it is belief having that faith that what Christ had done on the cross was enough to pay for everything that's all your work is. That's why it's called a gift. That God has given us that grace to give us a gift of Jesus Christ who died on the cross, he was buried and he rose again the third day, showing that all sins were paid for. Now I'll get into uh, Exodus 20:13, and it says, Thou shalt not kill. There's where the young lady stepped up and said, but I'm not a murderer. And I said to her, I said, I know you're not. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here with me. But, but take this into account. Have you ever been mad to the point where at some person you said, I hate that person so, so much. You know, the world would be better if that person wasn't here. I directed that to her, and she looked at me. She thought for a moment. She goes, I go through that struggle every day. I said, I'm sorry, honey, but you just committed murder. She didn't understand. And I said, you know what? I do it as well. I said, and she looked astonished at me, like, really? And I'm like, I do it as well. We all do. I said, that, that, is, that is the whole point of the law that was given to Moses. It says, I, I said to her, it's, it, it's to show no matter if we commit them physically or mentally, we have still broken all the laws. As Christ said, if you break one, you break them all. So whether you think it or do it, you've broken all the laws. Like I said, 613 laws that we know of, I know I've probably broken 10 in the last 20 minutes that I've been here. Not, not me personally, physically, but that old man. That old man keeps thinking it up. 
And as I was talking with somebody earlier about how camp went, you know, the devil still needs to throw them darts. Yes, there was a few rough spots at camp, but more and more God took care of all of us. Yes, there was a few darts that Satan got in there, but our armor, God put a hedge of protection around us that there was no major incidents, that the camp was not completely shut down. There was just incidents that needed to be straightened out and taken care of, and God did that. He gave the words to the people that talked to these people and straightened it out, and he took care of us. So as I'm talking with this young lady, I said, you know what, let's turn over to Galatians. Galatians 3, in verse 24. And it says in Galatians 3, 24, we'll read 3, 24 and 25. It says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. She kind of looked at me confused. I guess I didn't enter that in. She looked at me confused and was like, what? And I said, listen, God give Moses the law to show that none of us are perfect, that none of us have the perfect righteousness to go to heaven because at some point in time, Probably every second, every minute, we are breaking the law. And as I said earlier, if you break one, you break them all. There's not, oh, I got a little white lie compared to, oh, this is a great big lie. A lie is a lie. A death is a death. It's all the same. I said, if you don't believe that what Christ done on the cross, then not only do you die, Physically, your soul dies also. She pondered that for a moment, and she was like, oh, okay. So what you're saying is, it's not there to keep us good, but it's there to make us understand why. Why? And I said, well, what's the why? The question is, what is the why? why Christ died on the cross. I said, absolutely. Christ died on the cross for that law. It says right there in Galatians 3.25, it says, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We are no longer under that law. We are under the salvation, the grace of God, that is Jesus Christ on the cross. And once we believe and have that faith, what he did on the cross, we're no longer under that law. Things were starting to click a little. So we show how the law was given to show us how we were sinners. Turn over to uh, Romans. Um... Chapter 2, verse 11. And it says, and we're going to read down through 16, and it says, For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Um, for not the, bear, not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, uh, which, have not, which have not the law, do it by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a, are a law unto themselves, which show the, show the work of the law written in their hearts, their consent, 
consensus also bearing witness and their thoughts the meaning while accusing or else excusing one another. Now here's the deal. In 2.16 it says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of man by Jesus Christ according to his gospel. That's where it comes in. And I sat down and read this with her and she understood more and more that well, we're all judged by the law, and, and we're in the law. And, and I said, but what does the last verse say? What does 2.16 say? I said, even in your mind, you will be the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to, the God, to, his, um, to his gospel, according to my gospel. I said, Jesus Christ is the, the pivotal point here. He's the, he's the, the point of this. That what Christ did, you will not be judged by that law. There is no good that you can do to outrun, to outdo God's grace. There's no law that will save you. And she understood more and more, and and it was just it was exhilarating to watch that that understanding come across her that oh my gosh I would have to work harder and harder and harder and harder to save myself when all I have to do is believe what Christ did on the cross how simple is that I mean you could see that aha moment on her face of oh my gosh As believers, his commandment to us is love. Let's turn over to Romans 13. Romans 13, uh, verse 6 through 11. It says, For the... For this cause we pay tribute also. For they as God's ministers, attending a court, uh, continually upon this very thing, rendering therefore all their duties, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Um, I lost my place here. Honor to who honor. Um, owe no man anything but to love one another for he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law for this thou commandment for thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not kill thou shalt not steal thou shalt not bear false witness thou shalt, thou shalt not covet and if there are any other commandment it is briefly comprehended in this saying Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Wor love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law, and that knowing the time that now is the high time to awaken out of the sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believe, than when we believe. So God's commandment to go on to the world and spread his gospel, that is the love. The love thy neighbor. As you spread his gospel, you love thy neighbor. Then you know the gospel. If, you, if you're spreading the gospel, you know the gospel. That's why it says there in uh, uh, verse, verse, uh, where am I? verse 9, that thou shalt not commit me. Uh, commit adultery, kill, steal. That old man still is in that thought, but that new man, if you approach the world with love and sharing the gospel and sharing what Christ has done, 
that new man is fed, that old man is subsided. Not saying he's not going to flare up, because you know as well as I do, the devil's going to throw them darts in there. Well, look what he did today. Well, look what they're doing now. Those darts are going to fly, but with Christ as our perpetuation in heaven, it does not matter. Because our righteousness, or his righteousness, is put to our account. His righteousness of the new nature, the Holy Spirit, within us. And if you show that, if you humble yourself to that of love thy neighbor by sharing the gospel, love thy neighbor as you love thyself, then that shows through. And that's what, um, that will, is what will be seen of you. I'm getting short of time here, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. And it says, and I wrote down, and it says, and it is through God's grace that we believe um, what Christ did on the cross. For if it weren't for Jesus Christ, becoming man and going to the cross where he shed his blood for the payment of our sins and then died and then rose again the third day, we would not have received his righteousness to enter into God's perfect ha heaven. You know, God has a perfect heaven. He could not even look on sin. When Christ was on the cross and the cup of sin was poured on Christ, Christ's words were to God, Lord, why hast thou forsaken thee? God could not look at sin, so at that point in time, God must have turned his back on Christ. As that full cup of sin, of all our sins, was poured on Christ, God turned his back. And then at that point, at that point, Christ said to Telestai, it is finished. And then he gave up the ghost and died. You know, that cup of sin, the kids at um, camp, Rachel did an awesome awesome pictorial of the last hours of Christ leading up to his crucifixion and through his crucifixion. And that picture of Christ, of how he was beaten, beaten to a point where he was unrecognizable, but that wasn't the pain, as she put it, that wasn't the pain. The pain was when the cup of sin was poured on Christ. When God turned his back on Christ, the pain of the cup of sin poured out on Christ was his most excruciating pain. But he knew he had to go through it. Earlier in, in there, he said, earlier in the day or in the night, he said, if there is any other way, Lord, please pass this off from me. But he knew, he knew he had to go through that. And still, that's how loving he is to us, that he still took that pain for us. So I just want to recap the things that, that the law defines and defiles us. And to love. But not of the things of this world. One last verse I want to share with you is in 1 John. Chapter 2, verse 14 through 17. Verse 14 says, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. 
love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. He that do the will of God. He that is, as a commandment, is Christ's two commandments are, go into the world and pa- um, go into the world and give every creature the gospel and loveth thy neighbor and to love, he says. Those two in one are the same. The love and giving out the gospel. Because of the love of the gospel, of the love of God, we pass, um, we are passing on life from death. I met with a couple of men this week up at camp and and they asked me how camp went and I told them about camp and how a couple of you, you know, how many got saved and it was, I, I, I couldn't tell you how many numbers, we, we can't really pull numbers on them because did they understand it quietly to themselves or did they pro- proclaim it? No idea. But I know of at least two, maybe three, maybe even four that I know received it and understood it and became saved. And that's what the camp is all about. If there's only one per, one kid showed up and we saved that kid, that's what it's worth. But they asked me that, and I said, well, I know at least maybe three, maybe four. I'm not sure. I'm sure there was probably more that understood it more, but I know for sure these three, four. And they said... What a great gift. What a great gift that you have passed from death unto life with Christ. With God's grace that those at that camp have helped four individuals, at least four individuals, pass from death unto life. So I thank you for your time. And uh, we'll close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you as we come to you uh, to celebrate your word. As we grow further and further into your word, that we understand more and more of your love. And the gift that you have given unto us, the major gift that we are without, we cannot enter into your perfect heaven. But that ticket, that gift that you have given unto us, is of your son, Jesus Christ, as he died on the cross. That that cup of sin, of all the world's sin, was poured upon him. And he went through that pain. And his precious blood was shed for us. (coughs) And that he died, he was buried, and then he rose again the third day, overcoming death, showing that just our belief in that, that we have overcome death, that we believed what your son did for on the cross, that we've overcome that death, and that we will have everlasting life with you in your perfect heaven. Dismiss us now, Lord. Give us a hedge of protection as we travel through the week, that we may come back here and enjoy your word again, and enjoy your love. And please, Lord, as we pass fellow believers during the week, please, Lord, give out the encouragement that we can encourage each other to move forward until the day that you bring us home. In Christ's name we pray, amen.